Hey, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah from the Midwest Writing Center, and I'm super, super excited today to be joined by Victoria Noe, who is a um, writer and activist and um, all around powerhouse in Chicago. Um, she has a lot of books. <laughs> um, one, uh, one book that I'm a big fan of, the one that, of hers that I have read is uh, Bag Hags, Divas, and Moms. The, I wanna say the little leg legacy of uh, straight women in the AIDS community. Um, it's a really, really excellent um, history and testimony of the 80s and 90s and the queer community. Um, she also is author of a series of books called Friend Grief, which um, is what it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's about bereavement when you, when you lose friends and she's got all sorts of different um, subjects for for who our friends are or what our experience is. And it's really, um, honestly, it's really touching. I'm so, so grateful to have you here. You're like a big, um, I feel really, really starstruck and I'm trying to act really chill, but um, oh <laughs> I'm a big fan and I'm really excited to have you here. Well, th thank you for having me. I'm overwhelmed already. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I um, I hope that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, <laughs> in a good way, in a good way, yes. <laughs> Um, so I guess we can um, get into it a little bit. I, I want to say, I guess I tried to say this at the beginning for the audience. Uh, we're going to do our interview, then I'll say, um, here's what's going on at the Midwest Writing Center. And since today is actually our last Write More Light video of the season, uh, summer is a super busy time of year for the Midwest Writing Center. Um, I hope that you will uh, take it very seriously when we ask you to write more light into your life until, um, until the fall. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so I gave a little bit of a sloppy, sloppy bio for you. But uh, what else, what else should we know about you? I know that you've had, uh, I want to say you, you call this your fourth career. Can you tell us about the, the previous three? Oh, sure. Um, I earned uh, two degrees in theater at the University of Iowa. And um, I performed a lot there, which wasn't my intent but I did and I enjoyed it mostly in musicals actually all in musicals but anyway um I went on eventually to move to Chicago to work in the theater community which I did um as a stage manager mostly and director I was a founder of the uh one of the founders of the League of Chicago Theaters which is the trade association of theaters in Chicago um and around the mid, early to mid 80s, I'd been in Chicago like six or seven years. And I wound up doing a lot of grant writing and fundraising, which you do when you're in theater. And I decided to go out on my own. And I did grant writing, grant writing and event planning for arts organizations. But by about 1985, 86, the AIDS epidemic was coming in. And so fundraising was my second career, but it morphed from the arts into AIDS. And I did primarily AIDS fundraising until 1994 when my daughter was born and I burned out on everything. And because in those days, self-care was not, it was frowned upon. And you worked 23 hours a day because people were dying and the people around you were working 23 hours a day. So I didn't know I could take a break. And, but I did, and I stopped. And then for 15 years, while my daughter was growing up, I sold uh, children's books to Chicago school, Chicago public school librarians who are the most wonderful people in the entire world. They are badass. They are, incredibly engaged. They are unsung heroes in schools, grade schools and high schools. And I, and I just, I adored them. But um, 12 years ago, I had a concussion, very minor fender bender. And uh, I couldn't do sales anymore. I just, math did not, math never came easily to me, but, but less easily to me now. And I just, I couldn't do it. And um, in those days, concussions were not taken seriously, especially those suffered by women. 
if I'd been a professional hockey player, I would have gotten all the attention in the world, but not so much. So I had to quit that and I didn't know what I was going to do. So a few years before, three years before, one of my best friends uh, was in remission from ovarian cancer. And I told her one day that I had an idea for a book. And it was about people who are grieving the death of a friend. And she's like, great, do it. And I'm like, I've never written a book before. Don't, you know, you have, you know. And she's like, oh, just do it. And um, six months later, she was dead. And it took me a few years to really commit to that idea. And then once I did, I realized I knew nothing about writing. I knew nothing about the publishing world. And so it was a very steep learning curve. But um, that's where I am. So this is number four. Well, I'm happy you made it here. Uh, I always, I'm, I mean, I, I always really like to see how real life um, blends in, braids itself in, weaves itself into, you know, how we become writers or um, how we find our life in writing. Um, but it seems like it just sort of hit you one day, like you needed to be, for lack of a better, for lack of a better term, out of options to, to get to it. Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, after it became clear, I had to give up sales. And, you know, the concussion is actually an ongoing issue. It was a fairly mild concussion, but I didn't get the treatment that I needed at the beginning. And um, six months ago, I had a second concussion. And I'm still dealing with that. But it's a lot easier now because I have a neurologist and, you know, I know what to do now. So it's easier this time. But it was um, not something I ever planned on doing, writing. Um, I didn't think I would be very good. At, I thought I'd be okay. Um, and you know, my goal with the Fag Hags book is going to sound really weird, but I felt like the writing in the Friend Grief books was like skim milk. And I wanted this book to be at least 2% milk. If not <laughs> no, I and, don't really get that. I, I mean, I haven't read your Friend Grief books, um, but it is definitely more, I mean, I called, I called this segment in advertising, I called it on literary nonfiction because I would I would say that this book I actually I have it on my on my e-reader because I was super poor when I decided to buy it and it was like less than half it was like a quarter of the price to buy the ebook uh -huh. um so that's a bummer for me because I wrote all over it but like that's not really the same uh anyway point being it's it's definitely literary nonfiction. you're um you're flexing your writing muscles in in telling those those stories well and it was you know I knew that the one thing that I was absolutely clear on when I committed to writing was I am never going to be afraid to ask for help. Partly because I knew nothing, but a lot of people, <laughs> but a lot of people know nothing and won't ask for help. And I knew I couldn't just figure it out on my own. And I had to find really good resources. I had to find people I could trust. And I was so fortunate. The first writing conference I went to was 10 years ago. And it was the writing, Writer's Digest Conference in New York. And I knew nobody there. Nobody. And the first night, I thought people were kind of weird. I thought people were kind of weird and snobby. And I thought, oh, this is not going to work. And the next morning, I started kind of falling in with it wasn't a group. We were all sort of there on our own looking the for outcasts. <laughs> the outcasts, you know, and um, we're still friends. We're still colleagues. We still work with each other and go to each other for um, advice and support. And they have helped me in so many ways. I just can't even begin to tell you. And a month after that, I took an online marketing class for writers. This is 10 years ago. So this is really 
the ice age compared to <laughs> and um and i met some more people on that in that group and i've been very fortunate because again i have not been embarrassed to say i don't know what this is i don't understand this i don't know what to do about this because i knew that there were people out there who would help me oh i love that that's so important i think that writing can be really really isolating and part of that is because we see this like mythical writer in our mind who just like drinks whiskey at a typewriter and never leaves the house um and we've like romanticized that but it's a very partially... it's a very romantic image <laughs> isn't it but personally i think there's a weird um i don't know like elitism among among writers in the writing community that's like you, you have to pretend to believe that you're better than everyone in order to be a real writer or something. It's a very pervasive, very toxic thing that I've seen. I don't I feel like I'm phrasing this really badly, but I've seen that too. And it's really, really tough and can, can really be damaging for. Well, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's less a sense of I'm better than they are and rather a sense of, I have something to say. And I have something to say that other people can benefit from in some way. And maybe it's, you know, if you write, you know, historical romance, it's, you know, take you away. It's an escape, you know. And if you write nonfiction, you know, then it's you're learning something or you're able to identify with someone. And, you know, that's been the, the best response I've gotten to my books is that people identify with them, with the people in them, with the stories, with the ideas, and that it's, it makes them feel less alone, you know, and, and that they learn something. I think, um, I mean, what you just said is so much nicer than what I said. I was like, I'm glad you have nice people in your life because everyone sucks. Um, but I think that you also really kind of put the, hit the nail on the head with like art in general and what, um, what, what we're making and what we're getting when we consume art is, I don't know, comfort. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. Um, so I guess, you, I didn't, I didn't know that you started writing your, your friend grief um, series before you wrote Fag Hags. Is that, am I understanding that right? Uh, before what? Before you wrote Fag Hags, you started on. Oh the, yeah, way before. The series? Way before. Uh, the first friend grief books came out in 2013. The last one in the series, there are six little, they're small books. They're like 15,000 words, the max. Um, the last one came out in 2016. And I was already working on the Fag Hags book then. But the last book actually came out partly because it made six and I like even numbers. <laughs> uh, and partly because I had all these stories that did not, these interviews I'd done that did not fit in the other books. And they were all with men. And the interviews I had with men were really amazing because I thought, oh, you know, th this is going to be like a 15 minute interview because they're going to answer yes or no or nod their head to everything. And the first interview I did was an hour and a half. And we were on the third question that I had for him. Oh, wow. And the shortest interview I had with one was 45 minutes, but he asked me to come back and do another 45 minutes because he wasn't done talking. And they went up to like three hours, the interviews with the men. And they had a lot to say. And I think that, you know, society in general tends to devalue men's friendships, you know, because we see the, the shallowness of some of their encounters, you know, and they revolve around sports or whatever. And so they're not as deep as women's friendships they're every bit as deep. And sometimes they don't realize how deep they are. And they don't talk about it because they're, it's not valued. So 
you know, they talked to me because I was there to listen. I was not there to diagnose them or criticize them or make any suggestions. I just wanted to hear their story. And so, it, you know, they were great interviews. I love that. I actually noticed um, the, the synopsis actually kind of, I mean, I'm not a man. Um, but the synopsis of friend grief and men, um, sort of spoke to me. I've thought, I've thought a lot lately for whatever reason on, on men's feelings, right. Um, on, um, on masculinity and, and how, you know, all the messaging is such that you can't have feelings. So I imagine that being asked to share them is quite an experience. Well, I, you know, I dedicated the book to my dad's friends. And when I was growing up, it was this group of men and they were loud, they were profane. They were, you know, they were just, I was scared of them sometimes because they were loud, you know, and, but, you know, when my dad was dying, they were there for him. And, you know, I, I say, you know, that when we finally called in hospice and a couple of them came over to the house right away and the biggest, loudest, most profane one in the group walked in the front door, saw my dad in his hospital bed, turned around and walked out and fell apart on the front porch. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. And they were there for him. They were there for my mom during and after. And it really, it had an impression, made an impression on me, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that. How, um, can you tell us how Bag Hags, Divas, and Moms came, came to be? <laughs> um, like I said, I was, I was finishing up the Friend Grief series. This was April Fool's Day, 2014. <laughs> And I was in New York visiting my daughter who was in college there. And um, we went, I took her to this um, discussion at the New York Public Library about, let, it was a panel discussion of women from ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And I had joined ACT UP the year before, connected to the Friend Group books. But anyway, um, so I took her with, and you know, a lot of people I knew were in the audience, and these women were talking about what they had accomplished in ACT UP, including a four-year campaign to change the definition of AIDS so that it would include women. Because the first 10 years of the epidemic, women were not diagnosed as having AIDS because it didn't present itself the same way in women. It still doesn't. So they launched a four-year campaign and got the government to change the definition. Okay. So I knew these stories, but I'd never heard the women who had done the work tell the stories. And, and it was very powerful, as you can imagine. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, somebody should tell these stories, but not me. I'm not, you know, somebody else, not me. And then I thought, I couldn't get this idea out of my head. And I thought, oh, somebody's already written about this. I'm sure somebody's already written about this. So I spent like the next year proving to myself that someone had already written a book about this and no one had. And, you know, I went through all the AIDS literature I could find. No one had written a book. And then I went to women's history books and I found this book that was, I can't remember the title, which is just as well, like a definitive, <laughs> definitive women's history of the second half of the 20th century. I'm like, okay, fine, it'll be in here. There was one paragraph about AIDS. It mentioned the four-year fight to change the definition, but didn't name any names. Awfully definitive. And I thought you could Google this and get the answer in 15 seconds. You know, I thought, oh my God, this is, you know. So then I decided, okay, maybe I will write this book. And I went on Facebook one night and I said, I'm thinking about writing this book. You know, do you know anyone I should interview, straight women who, to interview or um, 
resources for this. And about five minutes later, my phone started chiming. <laughs> and I was getting messages from people I knew and people I did not know with suggestions. How many do you want? You know, and the reason it's about straight women is because um, our experience was different than lesbians in the AIDS community. It still is, but dramatically different in the earlier days. And I felt like I'm not the person who should tell their story. You know, the good news is a couple of lesbians I know have been writing their story. One just came out, Sarah Shulman's book about the first six years of the ACT UP New York, which is huge and amazing book. Um, so that's not my story to tell, you know? And um, I had no shortage of material. No shortage of material. Um, I have probably a dozen interviews that never made it into the book. Um, and I didn't put them in because they were too similar to other stories. Um, but it, you know, it was, it has really <laughs> kind of taken on a life of its own. Um, I think, and I'm glad I did it. So I, I just found the book, just in case you were wondering what that noise was. Um, let, whoops, let the record show a political history of ACT UP New York. It looks amazing. Uh, like the cover is gorgeous. <laughs> um, it's, but it, yeah, I it's, say, it's, it's a big book. It's a big know, book. Um, I know in, in the early days, and I wasn't, I mean, I was, I was born in 1990, so I wasn't there. Um, just let me, let me age myself real quick. Um, but, you know, I know in the early days, and I've done some, some work in the positive, in the HIV positive community. Um, but, it, you know, in the early days, it was called the, the it was called GRID, right? The, the gay related immune disease. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I know, right, there, there were no gay women. Right. And there, um, there were no, as such, I'm sure there were no women at all. You know, this is all fake. I don't believe these things. Um, so of course, of course, there's no history. Of course, there's no involving women. Um, we're also not looking at things other than sex that um, contribute to the spread of HIV, um, which is. Well, but, you know, part of it was, you know, there's always been this territorialism and ownership. Um, by gay men. And I, I do not dispute that at all. You know, it's 40 years ago this Saturday, the first um, scientific article was published about this new mysterious gay cancer. And July 3rd, this coming July 3rd, it's 40 years since the New York Times ran a little paragraph about this strange gay cancer. And, you know, for so long, it was focused on gay men because mm -hmm. that's where it hit first. But it pretty became clear pretty early, actually, I in the first two years, that it was not just gay men and that it was not just pa passed through gay sex. It was passed through blood transfusions. It was passed through intravenous drug sharing needles. Um, it was trans, it was, you know, women who were HIV positive could pass along to the children when they were born. And, you know, one of the criticisms of the book that I got was that I was trying to rewrite history. And I'm like, well, yeah. And I am, because even now, this week, there was a panel discussion on the Today Show about the 40th anniversary of AIDS and Pride and their panel was for gay men. And I get that they're trying to combine pride and AIDS, but they're not the same thing. You know, even, I mean, most of the gay men I know are not HIV positive, you know? And to, I mean, it's a stereotype that, you know, I would have hoped was gone by the 40th anniversary, um, but it's not. And, you know, there was a lot of pushback, um, not just, you know, for women at risk or still at risk, um, but women who worked in the community. And um, 
and I understood it, but it didn't make the work easier sometimes. Um, but it, it's a very complicated history um, because the political and social issues um, that sprang up. I have actually noticed um, when I've gone to or, um, events, um, they're often, you know, when there's, when there are discussion groups and stuff, they're often segregated by gender. And I, I imagine it's because the experience is so different between, um, women who are HIV positive and, and men who are HIV positive, not to mention, um, people who don't fall within the binary. Um, but I never really considered it before, you know, why, um, why that may be, right? That's well, and, you know, I think that, you know, the focus rightly so was on gay men and at the beginning. And like I said, it was 10 years before women could be correctly diagnosed with AIDS, even though they were dying. You know, the, the slogan is women don't get AIDS, they just die from it. <laughs> and, that, and that was true. That was very true at the beginning. They could not be diagnosed properly, which meant they couldn't get the treatment. They couldn't be in clinical trials. They couldn't get disability insurance, nothing. And, you know, it, it was so awful. It was so awful. And something that you, I hadn't seen before. I think a lot of people hadn't seen that kind of, we have to fight to prove that we're dying. You know, and it was, it was very, you know, like I said, there was so much, you know, concern that by acknowledging that people other than gay men were at risk and were getting AIDS, you would, that would be an excuse to ignore what gay men were going through. Mm -hmm. And I totally got, I got it then, I get it now, but you know, you just, you make a bigger pie, you know, it's like, well, and it did take consider everything you could consider everybody. You don't have to exclude anyone. And it did take, you know, um, Ryan white was a, a white child who, um, for, for folks who don't know, um, Ryan white is, um, was a, a white child who died of AIDS, um, which he got through a blood transfusion. And um, there are government uh, funds available under the name Ryan White to, to support folks who are living with HIV. Um, and I, I was mentioning, I, I, it's, it's significant, right, to um, that people weren't paying attention or weren't sympathizing until it was a child, a white child, um, mm -hmm. who presumably had not... Uh, well, yeah, because the, there were, the, the people who had AIDS were divided into two camps. There were the innocent and right. there were the guilty. So if you were gay, if you did drug, IV drugs, if you were a sex worker, you were one of the guilty ones. If you were a baby born to an HIV positive mother, if you were a hemophiliac, um, if you got a blood transfusion and for surgery, you were innocent. And, you know, that was a very shocking thing to a lot of people that well we'll blame them but we won't blame them you know it was it was a strange time it was a very strange time not unlike now <laughs> um are you oh am i no i'm not muted um <laughs> i muted myself for a minute because i heard some some noise in other parts of my house um now you said that you were doing work um activist work before your daughter was born um, in this area. Do you, um, obviously you're passionate, right? And so I'm interested in, um, there was 20 years between your, um, your writing the book and your, your work in the field. And I'm wondering if and how um, your experience doing the activism informed your work when you were writing it. Because I know that you did a lot of interviews, you talked about a lot of people who are not you. Um, so if you can touch on that. Well, you know, I, I did not consider myself an activist until about eight years ago, because I felt 
you know, you couldn't be an activist unless you got arrested. And um, it's actually a very small number of activists who get arrested. And uh, in fact, when I walked into my first ACT UP meeting, they said, you know, like, what brought you here? And I said, well, um, I've never been arrested and I think I'm way overdue. <laughs> And I still haven't been arrested, but you know, when I was working in the in the AIDS field, you know, back in the day, I was too busy raising money. I, you know, I worked, I worked for a year for an organization that had one fundraising, averaged one fundraising event a week, and this could be anything from a black tie dinner to a drag show, to a brunch, to a bar night, anything. And most weeks there were more than one. And we also had to oversee fundraisers done by other groups to benefit my organization. And I was writing grants full time. I didn't have the time, I, you know, I watched what was going on, but I didn't have the time to do that. And then when I got back into this, um, I decided if I was coming back into the community to write about it, I had to be active. And one of the best ways for me to be active was through my writing. Um, 10 years ago, when we were, it was the 30th anniversary, um, Tracy Bame, who's the publisher of Windy City Times here in Chicago, the weekly LGBT paper, was doing a series called AIDS at 30. And every week there was a reflection by one or more people who had worked or volunteered, lived in the community in the early days. And she asked me if I'd like to write something. And I said, no, nah, I won't, I don't know if I remember anything. You know, she said, well, I'll try it. And <laughs> try. Sure, okay. And I sat down at the computer and I started typing. And it was like smoke was coming up off the keyboard. It was like this anger in me that I had suppressed for years came out. And it came out in what I was writing. And I thought, oh, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is scary. And um, I thought, this is not good. You know, all this emotion coming out. And then I finally had to convince myself that it was good, that this was the whole point of writing about this, was for those emotions to come out. Not just for me, for the catharsis, but for other people to understand what it was like to know someone who died every week for 11 weeks in a row. And, you know, to find out that a, you know, a classmate of mine from college died when I saw his panel from the AIDS quilt on the cover of a book. And, you know, it was, those, those are the kinds of things that happened all the time. And that was normal then. So, you know, I'm always trying to educate people about what it was like, because, you know, there are some similarities to COVID. It's not a perfect comparison, but, you know, I got triggered a lot at the beginning of this pandemic. My friends got triggered a lot, and we still are, and we're writing about it, and that's been a great, great tool for supporting each other, not just take care of ourselves. And that's so important. I think um, for whatever reason, um, when we when we get into like the writing world, um, we get, I don't know, very academic about it or, or art oriented and forget, you know, why we started, which is for catharsis or um, to communicate or uh, to escape, right? And right. I think getting back to getting back to that and acknowledging it and and noticing how helpful it can be, how much um, healing there can be from from writing is so so important. Yeah, you know, and like I said, I think you write because you have something to say. Mm -hmm. You think you have something of value to share, you know. And so, you know, what I've spent the last few months exploring is, okay, I know I have something to share, but are there other ways I can share it other than the obvious? And so, you know, I had my audiobook produced last fall. And congratulations. Thank you. Um, I did not narrate it. Um, 
I actually I wound up choosing a woman, a black woman who's an actress in LA, who's originally from Brooklyn. And um, and this was like late last summer. And I said, well, I want you to understand why I chose you. I said, I realized there was no reason why my narrator had to be a white woman. So I, I asked for audition tapes from women of color and you were better than anybody I ever heard. So that's why I picked you. And she wrote me back and she said, well, I want you to understand why I wanted to do your book. And she had a cousin who um, paid for her first dance lessons when she was three years old. He was a professional dancer. He, did, he was a backup dancer for Lola Falana and Sammy Davis Jr. and people like that. He had an injury and had to quit dancing. Um, and he died from AIDS. And she said, I wanted to do it for him and the women who took care of him. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to explode. You know, I mean, it was just, it was so unexpected and such a wonderful story. But that's been the story of the book. I mean, the more stories I got, the more women who came to me with their stories too. So it's just this, you know, these, these great connections. And I want to keep that going. So I'm working on an online course based on the book that will go into a little more depth about the history of, you know, what women have done in the AIDS community. Because I figure, well, that's, an, that's another way to tell the stories. That's so cool. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about that class. Pardon me? Tell, tell me a little bit about that class. Well, you know, I, I'm starting off doing a couple of live um, conversations about grieving your friends. So there's going to be one course that's just about friend grief, but the other course is going to be about these stories about women in the AIDS community. And like I said, I had a lot of material that didn't go into the book. <clears throat> so I have what's in the book, what did not get into the book, um, other stuff that I've learned and other women I've met in the meantime. And I feel like, you know, this is, you know, it's like, it'll be like a history class. Uh, no tests, you know, no term papers, nothing like that. It's just going to be a way to open up the history of the epidemic in a new way. So. That's awesome. Um, I know you have a couple of uh, other appearances coming up. Um, I wanted to know we are we are big fans here at Midwest Writing Center of Bishop Hill. Um, I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna be at Bishop Hill. Yes, I'm and, going to be there. Um, supposed to be there last year, and of course that didn't. Right. Um, so I'm lo I'm looking forward to going. I'm looking forward to going, and uh, I may wind up driving over to Iowa City while I'm this far out. So we'll see. But. Uh, you know, I'm doing that. I'm doing a couple of virtual events. Um, but I'm also, um, you know, the Fag Hags book is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people interviewed for the 40th anniversary issue of A&U magazine, which is an AIDS related magazine that focuses on the arts. Um, and I got a lot of attention when It's a Sin came out, the HBO Max series about the first 10 years of the epidemic in London. And, you know, it's like there's six gay men and one straight woman. And so my, fr my friends are calling me, texting me and emailing me, and they're like, we're watching this and we're thinking about you. And I'm like, well, don't think about me because every time I look at her, I get mad because they're <laughs> <laughs> because they're taking advantage of her and I want her to get out of there now. And I got interviewed a few times on that topic. Um, but it was great to talk about because it brought up, you know, a lot, it got so much attention in the UK and the AIDS organization saw huge increase in calls to their hotlines, in appointments, in requests for information. Oh, that's so it important. was just, it was amazing that, you know, and I don't think you got that here. I did not hear about any spike in interest in learning about 
It's, well, I, you know, I didn't even, I mean, I have HBO Max and I didn't even know about this. Um, um, and I'm, was, and I'm pretty. Was, uh, April, March or April? Well, I also have been, like I said, I've been um, involved in, in yeah. positive community. So I feel like it should have come it's across five, my radar. Five episodes. It's five episodes. Um, it's, I had a lot of problems with it. Um, I can't speak to the authenticity of the experiences in London. Um, in the 10 years that it took place, I spent exactly eight days in London. And so I can't, and I happened to be there on the first World AIDS Day. But, you know, but I have no frame of reference for whether this is what London was really like then. Um, but, you know, there are some things in it that are just very, there's a lot of shame, shaming in it. And there was certainly a lot of shaming then, but I thought there was a little too much of it. Yeah, I'm sure it's painful to watch. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to react differently than someone who wasn't around then or wasn't involved in the community then. Um, so, you know, I always try to post a caveat to, you know, my responses to these things. You know, when I know most of the people in Sarah Shulman's book, you know, that's a different experience than someone reading it who has no idea who these people are. So totally. Um, in I'm gonna back up a bit. Um, in in regard to writing nonfiction in general, particularly such, I don't know. Um, I don't want to say sensitive, but like personal heart, heart hearty um, issues. What are um, what are what are other parts of the job, so to speak, that um, that folks might not know about? What are the perks of the job? Oh, I said parts, other parts of the job, but I'll listen to perks if well, that's okay. um, yeah, perks. <laughs> um, well, I think that, you know, part of it for me is always I'm obsessive about research. I'm obsessing about making sure I have permission to use people's stories. Um, and also that I have a wide range um, in my stories. I could have written the Fag Hags book just about wealthy, rich, white, women in New York. I did not. Um, so I, ha I had to be sure that there was a balance in the stories, geographical balance, age balance, um, ethnic balance, racial balance. And that because that was important to me, you know, and because that balance made it more re true. I made it more true. I want to um, um, earlier you said the reason you talked about straight women is because it's not your place to tell the story of um, of the queer women involved in the in the early days. And I think a lot of people forget that too when they want to be inclusive, that not everything is their story to tell. So I wanted to thank well, you for yeah. bringing that up. Oh, thank you. It's I just felt very strongly about it. And and I was criticized for not including lesbians. I'm like, I should not be telling their. I should not be the ones telling their stories for the first time. Especially. I think that's really, really important to, um, to bring up every time you can that it's not always your story to tell. Well, and I, you know, I have always felt from the very beginning that I had one foot in the AIDS community and one foot out, and you know, lesbians for the most part could not escape the epidemic at the beginning because they were already in their community. I was not, I could walk away from it. I could go out with friends who had absolutely no connection to what was going on. Although it was very surreal and I didn't really like doing it because they were all about, why are you doing this? This doesn't have anything to do with I, you. I totally, totally know what you're talking about when you, when, when people just like don't have a care in the world and you're like, how do you exist like this? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it was very, I felt like I had to know my place. And, you know, with this book, my place was not to tell those stories. My place was to encourage lesbians to tell their own stories whenever I could. And, and so that's what I do. And, you know, the, you know, because I, I, I think, People get excited about issues and they want to tell the stories and they don't stop to think that maybe they're not the right person to tell the story. 
I think that's very common, uh, particularly when when we're passionate. I think we forget to to slow down. Mm -hmm. um, so research, I think you're I think you're probably right on the nose with that too. That um, like we'll know we have to do research, but we don't really think about how how much work that is. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, and you know it was. Um... You know, and research is not just, you know, sitting in the third floor reading room with the New York Public Library going through archives of ACT UP, you know. It's um, research is talking to people. Research is attending events. Um, when I was writing the friend group books, I went to New York a couple times to go to 9-11 related events. Mm -hmm. Got it, but that I, was so I was there for the ninth anniversary and then again the following year for the 10th. So the ninth anniversary, you know, every year there's like a gazillion events going on in New York. So I planned like three days, the 9th, the 10th and the 11th of September. And I went to three events each day. I could have gone to six by three events each day. I'm going to pace myself. Right. Yeah, that's not a small number. And so I went to three events. So heavy. And then I thought, you know, and one was the naming ceremony. Um, one of my classmates from high school died in the South Tower, and I was I'm there that year, and they mispronounced her name again. And I went on this year long crusade to have her name pronounced correctly, which they did the following year. But anyway, so I go to nine events in three days, and I decide, okay. On the 12th, I'm going to go relax. I'm just going to spend the whole day on self-care. So I took the A train up to the Cloisters, which is part of the Met Metropolitan Museum. It's medieval art on a bluff overlooking the Hudson River. And it's peaceful and gorgeous. And I, my favorite place to go in New York. So I spent the afternoon there, took myself out to dinner. I'm like, I'm fine. So the next day I had lunch with a friend, actually an old boyfriend, and um, I picked a fight with him in the restaurant. And we, I don't argue in public and we never argued until we broke up, <laughs> and, you know, and he's just this sweet guy. And I picked a fight. And we walked out of the restaurant and he went one way and I went the other. And I thought, what the hell just happened? And by the time I got back to my hotel, I realized this was not about him. Hmm. This was about what I had experienced, the research I was doing for the past three days. So I emailed him and apologized. And we actually discussed this a couple of weeks ago. He says, I don't remember that. I said, there's no reason why you should remember it, but Good. You know, he said, what did we fight about? I said, I don't know, but it was stupid, whatever it was. So I was not in therapy then. And in retrospect, I wish I had been because I think that when we are doing research and writing on topics that are trauma-based, that are rooted in grief, um, that we need all the support we can get. And because it is really easy, like I just described, to think you're okay, but you are not okay. Absolutely. I want to, I want to agree with that. I'm sorry, I keep looking down because I'm trying to make your, I'm, try, I'm playing oh, that's book, okay. trying to um, make the book cover show up and I haven't plugged, I haven't used it in so long that it, I had to charge it first. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that's, I'm really, really glad you brought that up too, because especially when we're working on something close to our hearts and or just something difficult in general, even if it wasn't originally a passion project, like right. you don't always know that you're not okay. Oh, that is absolutely true. And, you know, you might think that the writing you're doing is enough catharsis, but it's not. And so, you know, I'm a great advocate for therapy. Um, so a year ago, people started saying to me, you know, you should write another book in the Friend Grief series and write it about COVID. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, no, no, <laughs> I am not going there. I'm not going there. So by about September, 
I started thinking, well, maybe I, I don't want to write a book about COVID, but maybe I could rework the Friend Grief series into one book, which was the original idea, rework it, update it, and add some COVID stories. And so I start, I mentioned it, I am in therapy now, and I <laughs> congratulations about it, and we talked about it every week for a couple months. And she's like, why are you so resistant to this idea? Because you keep talking about it. Hard. <laughs> And I said, I don't want to go there again. I don't want to go to that point where I'm picking a fight with someone I'm not angry with. It's really hard. You know, and, you know, the Fag Hags book was hard enough because that brought up a lot of stuff too about grief and unresolved grief and survivor guilt. You know, it's like, I said, I don't, I don't want to go there. And she said, were you in therapy then? And I said, no. She said, well, you are now. And I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And so, I'll think about it. So it started to sort of crystallize in my mind. And then right before, like the end of April, before I went on this trip to New York last month, I started realizing that's not what this book is going to be about. This book is all going to be all about losing friends during COVID. And with, with special attention to long-term survivors from the AIDS community who are faced, who are living through their second pandemic. Yeah. Um, and what they have to teach about resilience and what they have to teach about surviving when your friends are dying. And so like three weeks ago now, I guess I was like, okay, fine. This is what the book is going to be. And I sat down and I spent the next two weeks writing an outline. I have never outlined any of my books, which I know is weird, but <laughs> you know, it's like I'll work on a chap. A chapter is a certain idea or person and I'll work on that chapter and then when I have a bunch of chapters I sort of rearrange them in whatever order I think makes sense mm -hmm. I have a three and a half page single spaced outline for this book and no one is more surprised than I am about this because <laughs> I've never done that I've never approached a book like this before and I've done a few months of research. I haven't interviewed anyone yet, but I have a long list of people to interview. Um, I'm not ready to interview them yet because this is a different kind of interview. The people I interviewed for all my books were talking about things that happened in the past. It may have been a couple of years. It may have been 30 years, but it happened in the past. Today. Yeah was there were not in the middle of it. It was not fresh. So I'm still working on how I'm going to structure these interviews. Mm -hmm. Because it's a different kind of interview when you're still in the middle of it. I, but probably, I mean, I've never outlined either, but I also haven't written nonfiction or finished a book. Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm sure it's also helpful to know, um, or to have, to get some direction out of that. Well, and you know, it was, I mean, I could see things before I left on the trip, I could see things sort of falling into certain categories and, you know, chapters for one of a better word and themes, you know, and they were, but they were not organized in my head, which not surprising. Um, and so I have my color coded file folders, which I do with all my books. Um, and these are pink. I don't know why they're pink, but <laughs> I bought a box of pink file folders. That's why they're pink. Um, and, you know, so there's, you know, I have a lot of research already on 
grief rituals during COVID and how our way of grieving publicly has changed because of the restrictions on physical contact. Um, and also looking at comparing those to the early days of the AIDS epidemic when churches would not conduct funerals, cemeteries would not bury the victim, people who died from AIDS, funeral homes would not handle the bodies, you know, families would not allow friends to attend services. Um, yeah, we did have a, a bit of that in the beginning, didn't we? Because people just, you know, uh, were so afraid of getting it. So, you know, we'll, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's all, it's going to be falling into place for quite a while. Um, I don't, I don't pretend to believe that this outline is the final outline. No, of course. You know, but it's giving me, it's given me sort of a roadmap. So I can look at this and say, okay, I've got this much research for this, but I have none for this. And I have people to interview for this part, but not this part. So I, it gives me, you know, a better sense of what I need to fill in. Um, and I'm not going to be, you know, sitting in the library, you know, at Lincoln Center, which is, you know, my favorite library. Um, because there's not enough written yet yeah. about all of this. Um, but we'll see. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I feel like I could keep asking you questions forever and in fact have oh. <laughs> another page of them, but we are um, That's okay. at, at that hour mark. I'm so, so grateful for your time and for your work. Um, oh, thank you, thank for, you. for being I really appreciate it. Will I see you at Bishop Hill? Uh, you know what? Maybe. That's not, oh no, no, that's next week. I won't be around. Um, oh. <laughs> but I encourage everybody who can to go. Oh, it's- um, Oh, we're, please do. We're yeah. uh, and it's outdoors, as I understand it. Oh, and I actually, I am doing a little workshop at Bishop Hill uh, during the event on um, uh, public speaking for painfully shy authors. Oh my God, that's so necessary. <laughs> that's so important. <laughs> because, you know, I have two degrees in theater. I'm fine getting up in front of an audience, but I know most people are not, so. That's awesome. Um, so I'll give... Um some updates on the Midwest Writing Center and then let you go have a wonderful day. Um, let's see. Um, I guess the big exciting things going on right now, of course, we've got Birdies for Charity and we are um, Charity 13701370. Um, your donation goes twice as far if you do it through Birdies. So um, please do, I'll put the link to that here in the chat. Um, of course, we have the David R. Collins Writers Conference happening the 24th through 26th of this month. Um, early bird pricing ends next week, so sign up soon. Uh, we do, of course, have tuition assistance and, and scholarships available for, for folks with need. And um, we've got Tarek Shaw on the novel teaching this, um, this summer. We have Joe Mino on the short story. We have um, Gail Marie Thompson on poetry. We have Liz Lenz on the personal essay and our keynote speaker and reading um, masterclass, sorry, keynote <laughs> masterclass and speaker, uh, Allison Joseph, who is an all-star of, of poetry. And of course our uh, faculty reading and those keynote events are both free and public. All of this is online this year. Um, we also, attendees have the opportunity to pitch uh, their manuscript to a couple of different in, independent presses, MWC Press and Legacy Book Press. And um, Joe Mino, Tarek Shaw and Alice, uh, sorry, Gail Marie Thompson are all um, doing one-on-one -on -one manuscript critiques. So it's also an excellent, excellent opportunity. Um, there's lots of, lots of great stuff um, coming out of this workshop this year. So um, visit our website and sign up, um, send us a message to ask any questions. And as always, please write more light into your life. Thank you again, um, Vicki, I guess. Can I call you Vicki? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I feel so intimidated. Um, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the work you do. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. Really great. Thank you.